Let's pray. God, thank you that you sent your son, the one God with us, to ransom us, to rescue us, that we would have the privilege of participating in the benefits of Israel's Messiah. It's a staggering thing. We come now, O God, to your word, and we would ask that you would teach us the way of your statutes, and we shall observe them to the end. Give us understanding that we may observe your law and keep it with all our heart. Make us walk in the path of your commandments, for we delight in them. Incline our hearts to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn away our eyes from looking at vanity and revive us in your ways. Establish your word to your servants as that which produces reverence for you. Turn away our reproach which we dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, we long for your precepts. Revive us through your righteousness. And we ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. It may have appeared that two weeks ago, Ecclesiastes exited stage left. Uh, this morning, Ecclesiastes is back for an encore. And in one sense, Ecclesiastes will never leave us, for we will find its themes, the echoes of its voice throughout Scripture. Ecclesiastes is not an anomaly in your Bible. It is not the crazy uncle that you've heard about and you see once a year. You sort of keep to the side. Ecclesiastes, I hope, is not a book that you just stumble upon in your yearly reading plan and get through it as best you can, wondering, is this book really supposed to be in my Bible? What I want to do this morning is help us to summarize Ecclesiastes and see how its themes trace all through Scripture. You see, Ecclesiastes is in the stream of the rest of your Bible. Ecclesiastes meets us right where we live, in between the fall and the final restoration of all things. You and I could draw on the parallels of Ecclesiastes in, in really any section of Scripture. We could look to Jesus and his teaching in the Gospels and find Ecclesiastes themes there. Certainly we could look at the parallels to the rest of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament and see Ecclesiastes in those we could turn to Genesis and Deuteronomy and, and see the foundation laid for the things that Solomon presented in Ecclesiastes. And we could look in the writings of John or Peter or any of the number of Jesus' disciples that wrote in the New Testament. But for this morning, I've selected the Apostle Paul. I want us to trace the themes of Ecclesiastes as they echo in the theology and the letters of Paul. There is one probable quote of Ecclesiastes in the New Testament. There are a number of clear allusions, and then there is a whole host of parallels to the themes and thoughts and ideas and theology of Ecclesiastes. This morning, we're going to trace some of those parallels, and we'll limit our thoughts to the writings of the Apostle Paul. We're going to be looking at a lot of Scripture this morning, so I hope you have your Bible with you. I hope you're ready to turn to some pages. Uh, thankfully, the, those who have assembled our New Testaments have put all of Paul's letters together in one place. So from Romans to Philemon and the book of Ecclesiastes, that is our text that we're going to be looking at this morning. We won't read all of it, uh, but we're going to look at the various pieces of that. And so we'll look at 15 themes or theological concepts that we saw in Ecclesiastes unfolded in the writings of Paul. We'll begin this morning by looking at the doctrine of Scripture. The doctrine of Scripture. And I want to remind you in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 9 through 12, these words from Solomon. In addition to being a wise man, Solomon writes, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered, searched out, and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. 
The words of wise men are like goads, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. Beyond these, my son, be warned. Those are Solomon's words, and a remarkable picture of the unfolding of the doctrine of inspiration of the Bible. Of course, we see this theme in Paul's letters. You can turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. There, there Paul says something very similar to Solomon's words. We saw Solomon to describe the work, the labor, the intentionality that he went into in composing Ecclesiastes and yet recognizing that there is a capital A author composing along with him so that it is error-free, authoritative, and is in fact the breathed out word of God. This is how Paul describes all of Scripture. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is expired or breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And I believe there in 2 Timothy, Paul is describing not only the Old Testament scriptures, which he calls the sacred writings, but he includes in this banner of all scripture his own teaching his own giving forth the word of God. Much like Solomon in Ecclesiastes recognized that he was writing, but God himself was superintending the composition of this work. It becomes God's word. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Paul gives us another insight into his doctrine of Scripture. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he describes the Thessalonian response to Paul's writings, to his words. He says, for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it. Not as the word of man, but as it really is, the word of God. There you see Paul is even consciously aware that as he writes scripture, he is aware that God is the one authoring these things. It bears the stamp of inerrancy and authority of God's word. And of course, in 1 Timothy, you can look at 1 Timothy 1.3, but all over 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, you have warnings against following other teachings. Just as Solomon said, listen to God's word and be warned about things beyond it. Paul similarly holds up God's word and warns us about other teaching. We see not only in Ecclesiastes, but also in Paul, the dual authorship of Scripture, the uniqueness of God's word, the authority of God's word. And one of the pervading themes of Ecclesiastes is the contrast between an under-the-sun perspective on wisdom and a looking up to God for true wisdom. You can trace those themes in Paul through 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. You also see in Ecclesiastes the difference between an eternal perspective and a temporal perspective. Where at times Solomon limits his gaze to that which can be perceived merely on a horizontal plane on an earthly scale. Versus that which we see when we look up. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.18, we fix our eyes not on what is seen but on what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. A second category we could look at in Ecclesiastes and find elsewhere is the whole theme of God being creator. Remember in Ecclesiastes 12, the the beginning of the end of Ecclesiastes, he gives this command, remember also your creator in the days of your youth. He presents God as creator, and and throughout Ecclesiastes, you have a reference back to the creation week, back to the origin of man and the creation of the universe and the fall of man in those opening chapters of Genesis. Additionally, Solomon chooses to refer to God by the title Elohim, God, the one who creates, the, the creator and sovereign over all of the created order. The idea there is that the, the God that Solomon is presenting in Ecclesiastes is not merely a tribal deity for the nation of Israel, but is the one true universal God over all peoples. And we see this theme in Paul as well. In Romans chapter 1, 
He begins his argument in the book of Romans by appealing to the creatorship of God. Romans 1.20, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. We understand there that God's revelation is a revelation to all people everywhere of all time in the natural sense. Through what he has created, it is clear that there is only one God and he is the creator and sustainer of all things and he is the one to whom everyone is accountable. In Romans 3.29, we discover again in, in Paul that God is not just the God of the Jews. Listen to Romans 3.29. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Solomon's word in Ecclesiastes is a word to all men from the God who created and sustains all men. That leads us to another theme. If we think rightly about Scripture and we think rightly about God, we're left to think rightly about man in Ecclesiastes. And Solomon presents man as fallen. Man as fallen. The association with Adam occurs throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. We begin in Ecclesiastes 1.13. Solomon says, I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. And literally there the Hebrew is the sons of the man. The man. In Hebrew, ha-adam. You hear the name Adam in that, right? We are all sons of the Adam. We are all, in fact, sons of Adam, daughters of Eve. Solomon is quick to remind us in the opening chapter of Ecclesiastes and throughout that all of the problems and all of the frustrations that exist in our broken and cursed world have a relationship to our very identity as sons and daughters of Adam. We suffer what we suffer, and we suffer because we are related to our great, 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 great grandfather, who in the Garden of Eden rebelled against God. And what Adam did by choice, we all do by nature. And the world is broken and bent because of it. Solomon makes no bones about associating our suffering with who we are as sons of the man. This affiliation with Adam is a pervasive theme in the Apostle Paul as well. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Listen to Paul's words in Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. And what he unfolds in the rest of the chapter 5 is a relationship that we have in our identity with Adam. Compared and contrasted to the relationship that we have in our identity with the second Adam, Christ Jesus What flows out of our association and identity with Adam is the doctrine of total depravity. And we trace this throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. Listen to these statements. Ecclesiastes 2, 24. There is nothing good in man that he could eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. There's nothing inherent in man that that he could enjoy life the way life was designed to be enjoyed. Uh, The problem is not with the things of this world. The problem is with man himself. Chapter 7, verse 20. Solomon writes, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. Verse 29. God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Chapter 8, verse 11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, the hearts of the sons of men are given fully to do evil. Chapter 9, verse 3, there's an evil that is done under the sun, one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. And then chapter 9, verse 18, one sinner destroys much good. We hear these themes echoed in the Apostle Paul. In fact, the only 
uh, possible quotation from Ecclesiastes in the New Testament occurs in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. And there Paul says, there is not one righteous, not even one. There is no one who does good, says Paul. This is often attributed as a quotation from Psalm 14.3. And while the wording is more similar to Psalm 14, I think the concept is more similar to Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20. In Psalm 14, the psalmist has in mind the the enemies of Israel and their evil against God on a horizontal level against God's people, Israel. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon is more universal, uh, broad-brushing all of humanity as being totally depraved. That leads us to another theme in Ecclesiastes that we find in the Apostle Paul, and that is death as universal. Death as universal. Ecclesiastes 3.19. Solomon tells us, The fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they have all the same breath, and there is no advantage for man over beast. All is vanity. It's a depressing statement. We all go to the grave. We all die. We all face death. Listen to chapter 6, verse 6. Even if one man lives a thousand years twice and doesn't enjoy good things, do not all go to one place, meaning a grave. Chapter 7, verse 2, Solomon says, It's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. Better to go to a funeral than a birthday party. Why? Because that is the end of every man and the living takes it to heart, Solomon says. And again, listen to Romans 5, Paul's words there. Through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men. In verse 14, death reigned. And in verse 21 of Romans chapter 5, sin reigned, or it's the verb form of the word king. Sin, kinged, reigned, ruled, dominated in death. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, in Adam... All die. Death is universal. When we finished up Ecclesiastes, we we saw the wasting away and the aging process in the first half of chapter 12. You you remember that scene in the dramatic, poetic fashion in which Solomon describes the aging process, the, the wasting away of the physical body. Listen to the way Paul describes our earthly body as it is sown into the ground. Uh, Prior to the resurrection, uh, the earthly body, the the body that sometimes we think is so strong and and, and feels sometimes invulnerable, the older you get, the less you feel that way. And, And Paul describes it this way, perishable, dishonorable, weak, and natural. In 2 Corinthians 4.16, Paul echoes Solomon's aging Description. 2 Corinthians 4.16. Paul says, our outer man is decaying. Our outer man is decaying. Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. He goes on in 2 Corinthians 5 to say, we know that if our earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down... You feel that destructive final end of your physical existence on this earth described as a a dwelling place that is just torn down, uh, like that house falling into a decrepit state in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. A fifth theme we see in Ecclesiastes and in Paul is the idea of a frustrated universe a frustrated universe. You remember that Hebrew word we all learned together, havel, futility, vanity, emptiness, transitoriness, that which is like the, the steam off the cup of a coffee. It's there one second and then it's gone. And trying to find meaning in life, in things under the sun, without a reference to worshiping the one true God, is like chasing the wind. You try and you try and you try to keep on finding meaning and stuff under the sun. And you get nothing. 
Ecclesiastes opens and closes with this dramatic statement. Chapter 1, verse 2. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And then in chapter 12, like bookends on this book. Chapter 12, verse 8. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. It's nearly the first word and it's nearly the last word in Ecclesiastes that everything is futility. But it's not quite the last word. It all of that leads to Solomon's conclusion in verses 9 to 14. Vanity does not get the final say. Futility is not the final say. But it is a reality in this world. We live in a frustrated universe. And why is the world frustrated? Ecclesiastes 7.13, Consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what he has bent? God has taken the created order and bent it, altered it, so that it cannot yield the delight and the joy and the meaning that otherwise would be available in it. God has programmed the universe so as not to give us ultimate things satisfaction, lasting joy, meaning, fulfillment apart from him. It is bent so as to cause us to be frustrated by it and to look up, to look beyond the sun and to find our meaning in him. And I believe Romans 8 that Scott read earlier is a clear allusion to the frustration, the futility, the vanity of this broken world. It's not the way it should have been, and it's not the way it will always be. Listen to Paul reflecting on the central theology of Ecclesiastes in Romans chapter 8. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility. There's that word. It's hevel in Ecclesiastes. When Ecclesiastes is translated into the Greek version of the Old Testament, uh, that, that Paul is using that word for futility from Ecclesiastes here in Romans 8. Same word. And the creation was subjected to futility. Who did the subjecting of creation to futility? The creation didn't do it willingly, but because of him who subjected it. God did that. God bent the universe. God subjected the created order to futility. Why? In hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You know what that means? That means the broccoli and the granite and the dolphins can't wait until you look like Jesus. When you and I are finally conformed into the image, the glorious, perfected image of the Son of God who is the image of God in man. We were created to be like him. We were redeemed unto our recreation into his image. And when that process is complete, the creation goes free. The creation gets unbent. The futility is over. That's one of the great promises you find in the the closing chapters of Revelation 21 and 22. The curse is done. God's curse on the created order ends when his process of redeeming a people for his own possession and conforming them into the glorious image of his son is complete. And the creation itself gets to go free from its slavery to corruption. So what is the creation doing in the meantime? Verse 22, Romans 8, the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And we ourselves, verse 23, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. And what does Paul tell us to do with this information? Verse 24, in hope we've been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. Who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. In other words, don't fix your gaze just under the sun. Look up. Hope. Wait eagerly. There is a redemption coming. 
This same word for futility shows up in a couple other interesting places, specifically speaking about unbelievers in their thinking. Same word is used to describe the futility of their speculations in Romans 121 and the futility of their thinking in Ephesians 4.17. We should never assume that mankind in rebellion against God is somehow neutral intellectually, free to think about things and analyze information any old way he wants. No, the human intellect is as bent and broken as the entire universe is. bound up in futility of thought. There's another theme prevalent in the book of Ecclesiastes, the sovereignty of God. Ecclesiastes 3.11, after telling us that there's a time for this and a time for that, Solomon explains what he means. He says, God has made everything appropriate in its time. God has made everything appropriate in its time. In verses 14 and 15 of chapter 3, everything that God does will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it. There is nothing to take from it. For God has so worked that men should fear him. That which has been already and that which will be has already been, for God seeks what has passed by. In other words, from beginning to end, God's plan is perfect. He is orchestrating everything in the universe according to that perfect plan, and you can't thwart it. Of course, this theme is prevalent in the Apostle Paul as well. Ephesians chapter 1, 11, Paul says that God is working all things after the counsel of his will. In Romans 9, verse 16, Paul says it doesn't depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. In Romans 9, 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For Who resists his will? The answer to that is no one. The sovereignty of God is not just seen as an abstract concept in Ecclesiastes, but works out in the way Solomon encourages us to think about human governance. Human governments, including the one that he ran, are run by flawed representatives. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, This is an element of trusting in the sovereignty of God in a broken world populated by sinful people, including the king who's a sinner. Solomon says, do not be shocked. Don't be shocked when there's a denial of justice and oppression of the poor because one official watches over another and there are higher officials over them. After all, a king who cultivates the field is an advantage to the land. In other words, Human government really stinks, and it's advantageous, right? It's better than anarchy. So what is Solomon's encouragement? Chapter 8, verses 2 to 5, keep the command of the king because of the oath before God. There, our human submission to earthly authority has a vertical component. Don't be in a hurry to leave the king. Don't join in an evil matter. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? The one who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble, for a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure. Uh, This sounds an awful lot like Paul's instructions for submitting to God by submitting to flawed human authority, which will give account to God in Romans 13. Paul there writes, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will receive praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it's necessary to be in subjection. Now, Solomon was a flawed king, and Paul was a man who wrote under flawed emperors and actually suffered for doing good. In a flawed and broken world, these aren't universal statements. Don't worry, you'll never get in trouble if you only do what's right. 
No, there's a recognition that we submit to earthly authority because we submit to God. God in his sovereignty has placed human authority, even flawed human authority over us for our good. Another theme in Ecclesiastes is the idea of eternity in the heart of man. Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has made everything appropriate and in its time. He has also set eternity in their hearts. He has set eternity in the hearts of humans, yet in such a way that man will not find out the work which God has done from beginning to end. So what exists in the human heart is a knowledge of the transcendent, an awareness that there's something beyond. It is why in every culture and every time, men have been worshipers of self, of false gods, of sports stars, of celebrities, or of the one true God. We were built to adore. And we were built with a built-in longing for that which transcends this life. And the way Solomon says that is God God set eternity in the heart. We find a similar concept in Paul, of course, in Romans chapter 1. There, it is the knowledge of God that God has placed in the human heart. Listen to Romans 1.19. That which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. And what you have Paul unfolding in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 is the external witness of nature, the internal imprint of the existence of God, and the bearing out of the conscience. So what does every human being who has ever walked the face of the earth know intuitively, internally, that God exists, there is such a thing as right and wrong? Transcendence or eternity in the heart is there. Another theme in Ecclesiastes is the theme of pleasure. And pleasure as an end in itself. You remember Solomon's experiment in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Solomon was the one with all the resources of all of the world at his disposal. In relative terms, there may never have been anyone as wealthy as he with as much access to as much opportunity to pursue pleasure as a scientific experiment to see whether or not it would yield meaning, fulfillment, happiness, satisfaction. And Solomon's grand experiment was a failure. In chapter 2 of Ecclesiastes, in verse 1, he says, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. He said this to himself. So enjoy yourself, and behold, it too was futility. At the end of the great list of all of the things that he tried, he says this, verse 11, I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was no profit under the sun. See, the pursuit of meaning through pleasure, or the pursuit of pleasure as its own end will only leave one empty. Ecclesiastes 7.4, the mind of the wise is in the house of mourning, while the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. Solomon knew that by experience. Listen to what Paul says about this kind of pursuit of pleasure. If pleasure is the end, if pleasure is the goal, he, he talks about widows in 1 Timothy chapter 5. And he says, The one who is a widow indeed and has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. Verse 6, But she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. And that's the great temptation is to think that pleasure is life. And Solomon knew that was a vanity. And Paul says that is death itself. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 4, Paul describes what the end is going to look like. The end of human history is as the world gets closer and closer to the end of time. This is the last day's characterization of humanity. 2 Timothy 3, 4 
Men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, etc. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They've traded worship for the pursuit of pleasure as its own end. Another theme in Ecclesiastes is the theme of work. And Solomon talks about work as though it's under the curse, because it is. <laughs> Every task under the sun was grievous to me. I remember quoting this to my youth pastor uh, when he sent me out to pick weeds outside the church. I found Ecclesiastes and I read it to him. It's grievous to me, all the toil done under the sun. But that's not all Solomon says about Ecclesiastes. Recognizing the curse on work from Genesis 3, he goes on to commend work. Ecclesiastes 3.13, every man who eats and drinks and sees good in all his labor, it is the gift of God. You see, God gives a satisfaction in labor so that even that which is under the curse can be a source of good. Ecclesiastes 5.12 the sleep of the working man is pleasant. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. You got one shot at this life. There's no planning in Sheol. <laughs> so whatever it is that you're about, and this is in the context of enjoy life with your, the woman whom you love, uh, this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. I think Solomon is making a reference to your calling and all that you do in life. Of course, these themes of work redeemed find their way in the pages of the New Testament as well. And though work is still under the curse by the time you get to the New Testament, we find these words from the Apostle Paul in Colossians 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men. Doesn't that echo what we just heard in Ecclesiastes? Do it with all your might. And, and here with the vertical component, this means that wives and husbands and children and slaves in the immediate context of Colossians 3, whatever your occupation, whatever your task, whatever your enterprise, there's nothing mundane in it. You do it vertically. It's worship. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you. And of course, Paul has to warn the Thessalonian believers about those who weren't working, weren't providing for themselves, were being lazy. The words for strife, uh, striving and labor and toil are some of the most common vocabulary in Ecclesiastes. And the same words are words that Paul picks up on a number of occasions. In fact, he uses them in the same pairs that Solomon uses them. At Colossians 1.29, Paul says this, For this purpose I labor and strive according to his power which mightily works in me. And the laboring and striving Paul describes there in Colossians 1.29 is the, is the labor, the toil of proclaiming Christ to everyone that he meets, to seeing them all complete in him. In 1 Thessalonians 2.9, Paul describes labor and hardship in his longing for the work of ministry. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul gives this admonition, your labor in the Lord is not in vain, right? After all of the vanity uh, that you could be thinking about related to work and labor and striving and toil, Paul says that which is done for him, no matter the occupation, it's not in vain. Money is a theme in Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, uh, we've seen that uh, Solomon presents money as a tool. Uh, money can accomplish things, and yet money is fleeting. And he warns us about love of money. Ecclesiastes 5.10, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This, too, is vanity. In verse 13 of chapter 5, there's a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun, riches being hoarded by their owner to his hurt. 
This is similar to Paul's instructions to leaders in 1 Timothy 3.3. He says, if the leader in the church must be free from the love of money. Listen to his instruction in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many grief. Paul knew what Solomon knew about love of money. And yet he also knew its value. Listen to what Solomon says, or Paul says, in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, verses 17 and 18. Instruct instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. In other words, it's not money that's the problem. It's what we do with it and it's our attitude towards it. In Ecclesiastes 5.15, Solomon reminds us that you can't take it with you. Verse 15, as he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. And Paul echoes these words in 1 Timothy 6.7. We have brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of it either. Solomon commends marriage. Ecclesiastes 9 9, enjoy life with the woman you love. And you know of Paul's instruction, husbands, love your wives, in Ephesians 5 22 and following. A pervasive theme in Ecclesiastes is the theme of enjoyment. And this may have come as a bit of a surprise commands for the enjoyment of life. Life is to be lived and life as a gift from God in the context of worshiping God is to be enjoyed. Ecclesiastes 2.25. Who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? Right? Ecclesiastes 3.13. Every man who eats and drinks sees good in all of his labors. This is the gift of God. Ecclesiastes 5, 18 and 19. Here's what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, to enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him, for this is his reward. Chapter 6, verse 2. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God has not empowered him to eat from them. This is vanity and a severe affliction. In other words, you can have all of the stuff that could potentially produce enjoyment and God withholds the satisfaction that it could produce. Why? Because God gives the gifts and God gives the ability to enjoy the gifts. You can't have the ability to enjoy the gifts rightly until you're rightly related to him. But enjoyment is there for those who belong to him. Ecclesiastes 8.15. So I commended pleasure For there is nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and to be merry. For this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life which God has given him under the sun. Right, and the clue in those passages where Solomon seems to say, pleasure's terrible, don't pursue it, and pleasure's great, pursue it. The difference in those passages is God. God gives enjoyment. Or enjoyment is its own end. Ecclesiastes 9, 7 through 9. Go then, eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart. God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time and let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life which he has given to you under the sun. For this is your reward in life and your toil in which you have labored under the sun. And Ecclesiastes 11, 8 and 9. If a man should live many years, let him rejoice in them all and let him remember the days of darkness for they will be many. Rejoice, young man, during the days of childhood and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood and follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes and know that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. 
these commands for enjoyment, commands for rejoicing, for joy, for fun, are not isolated in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, you have a list of scriptures there on the screen. Uh, by the way, I've printed these, I printed out extra copies of what's on the web, the web outline that has all of these scriptures there for you. So if you've uh, got carpal tunnel syndrome trying to write down scriptures, I'm sorry, I meant to say that at the beginning. Uh, but there are copies at the information table with all these references for you. First, in 2 Corinthians 1.24, We're going to see Paul commending joy, exemplifying joy over and over again. 2 Corinthians 1.24, he says, Not that we lord it over your faith, but we are workers with you for your joy. Paul says to the Corinthian believers. If there's any thought that the Christian life is to be lived in some sort of morose manner... (laughs) Only thinking about sin, only, only thinking about its consequences and, and just being very serious about life all the time and never cracking a smile. Uh, Paul knew no such Christian life. His concept of joy is in keeping with Solomon's concept of joy. The, these things come from God. Listen to Philippians chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 25. Paul writes, convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and for your joy in the faith. Paul was committed to seeing the Philippians have joy. Philippians 3.1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me. It's a safeguard for you. And you know Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And a lot of the context that Paul talks about joy and, and rejoicing, you think about Philippians, he, he wrote that from prison. In the midst of a broken world populated by sinful people under the curse of God, Paul knew what it was to have enjoyment, to have a joy that transcended his circumstances. And he commended that for the Philippian believers as well. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. In verse 9, Paul describes the joy he had in them. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? Paul knew what it was to have joy, to experience enjoyment, to rejoice over relationships, fellowship, and ministry in the Christian life. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice always, he commands. And then I read this earlier, I'll read it again in the context of rejoicing. 1 Timothy 6.17, instructs those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on this uncertainty of riches, but to fix their hope on God. And listen to this, God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. The New Testament is not devoid of the concept of God graciously giving his children good gifts in life to enjoy, to be thankful for, to appropriate in the context of worshiping him. And this theme so prevalent in Ecclesiastes is prevalent in Paul as well. Another theme in Ecclesiastes is contentment. Contentment. So what happens if I don't seem to have all the things I think that God should give me that I should enjoy? Well, Solomon gives this instruction in Ecclesiastes 7.14. In the day of prosperity, be happy. And in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. In other words, God's sovereign ordering of all events, good days and bad days, prosperity and adversity, sickness and health, are all part of his sovereign plan. He gets to be God, we're the creatures, and he holds us in mystery and intention on purpose. This isn't home. This isn't heaven. This isn't where we belong. This isn't where the curse is undone. We live under the sun. We live after the fall and before the restoration of all things. 
All of those joys that God gives as sweet gifts are reminders that he is good and he loves his children and they are foretastes and appetizers of infinite, unending, unadulterated, unbroken joy that awaits us in his glorious presence. So what do we do with that? When you're having a good day, thank God. Enjoy it as worship. And when things are difficult or challenging or adverse, remember this isn't home. Look over the sun and trust in him. There's another theme in the book of Ecclesiastes, a a serious theme. There's the theme of judgment. This is where Solomon is heading through this book. Ecclesiastes 3.17, he says, I said to myself, God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man for a time for every matter and for every deed is there. In a frustrating world, in a frustrated world, you and I are tempted to think things just aren't right. There must be something wrong with God because wicked people get away with it. I get wronged and and nobody's there to right it. Solomon knew better. There is a patience that is required. We understand that judgment is coming and that judgment is personally invasive, but for the believer it should also be pervasively comforting. In other words, you and I know that while things don't look as they should now, there is a day coming when they will. Solomon knew that. Chapter 8, verse 13 of Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes, it will not be well for the evil man. And of course, in chapter 12, the conclusion when all has been heard, verse 13 is, fear God and keep his commandments. This applies to every person. For, verse 14, God will bring every act to judgment. Everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. The judgment of unbelievers, of course, occurs throughout Paul's writings. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. Paul warns us about taking lightly God's kindness currently. He says, because of your stubbornness and unrepented hearts, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. In a number of places, Paul describes the judgment that is coming. Paul also describes the assessment that exists for believers. Believers who, for whom there is no condemnation because they are in Christ Jesus will experience an assessment for their lives, for everything that is hidden, for everything that nobody seemed to notice. Of course, all of the sin of believers is paid for completely by the cross of Jesus Christ. But the ways that we have lived our lives, those things done in secret that nobody knew but the Lord, God himself rewards. And we give an account for ourselves. Romans 14, 12. Each one of us will give an account to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. Each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed by fire. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Don't go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes. He will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. And of course, the concluding theme of Ecclesiastes is the fear of God. The fear of God which produces obedience. This is the reverential awe of God as creator and he's big and he's scary but he loves me and so if I fear him I have nothing else to fear. But fear of him is appropriate. This isn't just an Ecclesiastes idea or an Old Testament idea. What Solomon ends with is fear God and keep his commandments. But the themes of fearing God and Obeying him are pervasive throughout the Bible and in the Apostle Paul as well. Romans 3.18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. When Paul's describing the universal depravity of sinful humanity, the fundamental problem is they don't fear God. (laughs) You begin to fear God in the way God intends when you come in by faith. Faith. 
and by belief. And your fundamental disposition towards God changes. Romans 6, 17, that fear produces an obedience. Paul says, thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. In 2 Corinthians 5, 11, Paul says, knowing the fear of God, we persuade men. We act as ambassadors between God and between our fellow man, pleading with them to turn to the one who can save. 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There it is again. Fear God and keep his commandments. Solomon said the one who is pleasing to God will flee the immoral woman. Paul tells us we make it our ambition to be pleasing to the Lord. Of course, the Apostle Paul has a significant leg up on Solomon. Solomon may have been the wisest man who ever lived, but he lived prior to Christ coming to the earth. So when Jesus was on the earth, Matthew 12, 42, he told the world something greater than Solomon is here, speaking about himself. And that one greater than Solomon is the one that Paul preached. Paul made it his ambition everywhere he went to talk about Jesus Christ and him crucified. If Ecclesiastes is to be read, it ought to stir our hearts over the frustration of this world, but it ought to push us towards fearing God and keeping his commandments. And the only way to do that, in other words, the only way to be rightly related to your creator is to come by faith through God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to earth so that he could die on a cross and rise from the dead to pay the penalty of our sin, to remove the power of our sin and our slavery under sin, and one day to completely eradicate even the presence of sin in us and in all of the universe. We look forward to that day. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way it is all one book. Though many authors were used by you to compose Uh, to write down these words. It is all of you. Uh, These are your thoughts. They are all true and authoritative and helpful for our lives. God, we just give you praise that you sent us the word, your son, to die in our place, to secure for us resurrection, forgiveness, adoption, reconciliation and eternity in your presence where we will no longer be frustrated by a broken and cursed world but get to live for the reason we were made and it is to this Jesus we sing it is to you that we offer our praises Amen